I'm waiting for the time to change too. <laughs> So where we left off on Tuesday, right? We was getting ready to make a, a bar chart. We talked about a pie chart. You know, you always have to have parts of the hole and so on. I gave you a little thought about this uh, relative frequency table because it was giving you the percents. Okay. Now, if I want to make a bar graph of this categorical variable, that's my choices. I think this is pretty much where I left off. If you've got a categorical variable, you can always make a bar chart. So I thought we would uh, see how that went by hand, just to, so I can get you a little feel for you know what's the bar is showing you, what's the bar is telling you. And so if I take this data, my variable here is field of study. Remember, my individuals here are 1.5 million full-time first-year students enrolled in colleges and universities in 2013. If I want to make a, a bar chart, well, I start like this. So the horizontal is your X, the vertical is your Y. I'm an X and Y guy, sorry. Okay? And you always put the categorical variable on the X, on the X axis. And what you're going to do is you're going to make little labels there. Remember the categories that's in the table? And so I'm going to give you like two of these. And when I look back here, the two I have is arts and humanity. All right, so I put that label, give myself a little distance, and then the next one is, what is it, biological sciences? And then you would continue, right? All those categories that make up your categorical variable, you'll just list them there, and then the bars will be above each one of these. Now, that's the categorical variable goes on the X. On the Y, you got two choices here. Remember I told you about the distribution of a categorical variable. You list the categories, then you either give me the counts or the percents. In this case, it's percent, right? So I'm going to label this percent. We need to start at zero. What I'm going to ask you is how am I going to chop that axis up here by hand? Well, when I come over here and look, the smallest value I see is 2.4, and the largest one I see is what, 14.9? So if I go from zero to 15, I have all the values I need, correct? Well, you're going to start here at zero, and I count really well by fives. <coughs> okay? So if I look at the arts and uh, humanities, it's 10.6. So I come here, put a line where 10.6 is. Yeah, that's pretty close. But we're not going to be exact, right? Hell, I'm making it by hand, and then I'm going to make myself a little bar. That little bar represents that 10.6 percent of students that chose that as their field of study. If I look at biological sciences, I see 14.7. I make myself a little line there where 14.7 is, and then I make myself a bar. And one of the things, if I was doing this by hand, I'd try to make sure I did was I want the bars to all be the same width. I don't want you to focus on one being skinny, one being wide. I'm interested in the height. That's what tells me everything, all right? So I try to be as good as I can, okay? And then you continue, right? Now notice, on the bottom here, I got these laid out for you, just how they are in the table. Makes no difference what order you put them in. There's always gaps between the bars in the bar graph to say, okay, that bar goes with that category, that one goes with that one, and so on and so forth. If you'll look in your book on page 18, and I'm looking at figure 1.3, part A. For those folks that don't have the book, what, you're, what the rest of us are looking at is they finished the bar graph for us. They got all the categories there, okay? Now, there's two of them. There's an A and a B. The one that's an A, the categories are just arranged, I'm assuming they're alphabetically, or at least the way they are in the table. The other one goes from the largest bars to the smallest bars. Does it make any difference to us? Is that going to change what I'm seeing? No. So I got a question for you. The reason we're making that bar chart is because it's supposed to show us the distribution of our variable. And in my variable down here, I'm going to write this in just for this problem. Field of study. You know, what was we looking at? Remember, it's categorical. Does the bar graph, does the bar chart, does it show you the distribution? 
Does it show you what values the variable is taken, and does it show you how often it is taking those? Because if you tell me no, then we're wasting our time here because that was the reason we were making the bar graph to start with. Well, remember I labeled number one was what values? There's number one. There's the values. There's the categories. That's how you chopped up the x-axis. Does it tell me how often? That's the bars. The height of the bars tells you how often it takes that. You can read off of here. Now look, I'm going to give you, you're not going to read no 10.6 off here. If I gave you this on a test, you'd tell me, well, it looks around 10% chose arts and humanities, right? And then you might tell me 14 or something like that for biological sciences. You're not going to read no 14.7 off of this. Now, that takes me back to the point. I made this by hand. When I start asking you questions on the test, and I ask you, like, okay, so you're looking at this bar chart of, uh, bar graph of field of study. What percent of the students chose arts and humanities? And I start giving you A, B, C, D. I don't give you 10, 10.1, 9.9, and 9.8 as your four choices. I give you 10, 15, 5, and 6. You're going to pick 10. I understand where, you know, you're not going to read those little points, Okay. Um, that's your bar chart. Now, I'm not done talking yet. So, every time I make a graph for you, or you make a graph for yourself, you're supposed to ask yourself, what do you see? Well, first off, you see the distribution, right? You see the categories, and then you see the percentage that fell on each one of those groups. The next thing is, is when you're looking at a bar graph, what you would like to pick out is two things. Which group, which category has the most individuals, Looks to me like it's on my table here. Looks like other. And the next two that are close are biological sciences and business. Everybody agree? What am I doing? I'm looking for the largest bars because the higher the bar, the more individuals that's in that group. And then I would like to know which group has the smallest number of people. Well, it looks to me like physical science is really small. And math, and I'm assuming that's math and computers. Those are the two smallest bars. Everybody understand what I'm saying? So don't be shocked when people's asking you about, okay, what's the most frequent group? That's the highest bar, right? That's the one that has the most in it, okay? Now, I'm not going to make the pie chart by hand because if I'm going to do that, I've got to pull a calculator out and start figuring out how big to make the angle, and we're not going to do that here. But on the top of the page 18, there's a bar chart there. You notice they got the different colors of the pie and all that, and then they have the little labels of the chart. So my question is, does that pie chart show you the distribution? Does it show you the values? They got the little chunks of the pie labeled, correct? Does it show you how often? Do you understand that the larger the chunk of pie, the more individuals that's in that chunk of pie? It doesn't actually tell you 10% or 14.7, but you're still telling you how often by how big the chunk of the pie is, all right? So let me ask you this. You're looking at that pie chart, and I ask you, what do you see? What's the largest chunks of pie? Well, don't be telling me any answer different than I told you with the bar chart because that's just another graph of the same set of data, right? It's still the same answer here, okay? Look, I would like to make the bar graphs and the pie chart more than that. The only thing to remember about them is when you make a bar graph, there's always these little gaps there, and that's because you've got this category, that category. The heights of the bars are telling you one of two things, either the percent, if that's how the data is given to you, or it might be the count of individuals, how many right individuals fell in that particular group. Okay, You can always make a bar graph. You cannot always make a pie chart. You can only make a pie chart when the categories are parts of the whole, parts of the total. If you want to see that in action, you look at example 1.3. And what we have here is it says, what sources do Americans, I'm reading an example, what sources do Americans aged 12 to 24 years uh, use to keep up to date and learn about music? Among those saying it was important to keep up with, with music. Arbitron asked which of several sources they had ever used. Here are the percents who have used each source. So again, they have a table here. You know, what source they're using, that's a categorical variable. And there's a table on page 19. 
the sources, AM, FM radio, friends and family, YouTube, so on and so forth. It says the percent of 12 to 24 year olds who have used each source. Well, AM, FM radio was 72, friends and family 79, YouTube 77. Are these parts of a whole? No. Are you going to make a pie chart? No. You can make a bar graph, and that's what's in figure 1.4 here. What is the most frequent source of new music information? It looks to me like friends and family and YouTube are the two top ones. What's the smallest? It looks like, what the hell is Spotify? Yeah, I'm out of touch. Spotify and Sirius XM satellite radio. Those are the two smallest bars. We okay with all that? Now, here's what I would like to do. Again, if I could say something else about this, I would. There's nothing else to say. Categorical variable, you can always make a bar graph. Right? Sometimes you can make a pie chart depending on what your data looks like. If it's parts of a whole, make a pie chart. If it's not, the bar graph. Now, here's what's going on with me, all right? First off, I'm in D2L here. Gold Lab Instructions. This right here is for installing Citrix Receiver, which is going to allow you to use Minitab at your house. If you're sitting at a university computer, you're going to go right here to all programs. You're going to come down and find mathematics, and you're going to choose Minitab 17. If you want to work from home, you're going to do exactly what this says. That's not my instructions. That's instructions from Information Technology Services, ITS. Okay? Now, here's the warning. I've tried this, I tried this every semester, and I've tried this three different places. I've tried it at home, I've tried it in my office, and I've done it here already. And I'm always using a PC, and everything has worked good. Okay? If you have a Mac, this, when you do this with the Mac using, what's the thing here, Safari, it will not immediately install the Citrix receiver. It will put it in your downloads and you will have to actually go in your downloads and install it and it will show up in your apps. Okay? Then after you've done that, then everything should work the way I, everything else works. Sarah, are you listening to us tonight? She is. She's afraid. No, I already had an email. We had an email that there was issues and the issues should have been fixed. So, you know, I follow this. Now, one other warning. I don't care what kind of computer you have. If somewhere in the installing, right, because it's going to ask, if you've got a PC, it's going to ask you to install it. If you've got a Mac, you're going to physically actually go and install it. If it asks you for a server or an email address that the IT gave you, it is goldlab.etsu.edu. That's where the server is. All right? And then whatever kind of usernames and passwords, those are your usernames and passwords from the university. Okay? Hmm? Oh no, the, the, the server is goldlab.etsu.edu, which is you know where I'm eventually going to go here tonight. Okay? That if it asked you for a server and email address that the IT department gave you, that's what it is. Okay. So Okay, now I'm going back here. That's, that's, that, that will get the Citrix receiver installed on your machine, and then you can go and we can get Minitab to work. Now, I'm, I'm hoping that everything runs smoothly here. Okay, because I just opened up another Firefox here. I've already got the goldlab.etsu bookmark, right? So that's where you go to actually start to get in. And then I'm going to put in no ETSU part, but my that's my username and password for my ETSU stuff, okay? It'd be nice if I knew it.
you'll get this little thing here that says you won't do anything bad using ETSU stuff. Now, remember, I've already installed that Citrix receiver. The first time you go in, another little thing pops up and asks you to install it. There's a little thing there that you want to make sure you check that I agree with everything they wanted me to agree to, and then you click install. It'll install, a little window will pop up if you're a PC. If not, it won't install. It'll be in your downloads. You'll go in and get it. Okay? And then I click the math folder, and there's my mini tab 17. Please work. So that's always a good sign if I get this far. We can sit and look at it for a few seconds. So here's the thing, all right? I'm praying that this loads. Then many tabs are going to pop up, and I'm going to show you how to make a bar graph, a pie chart from that data. Remember, you were going to go out and try to download those many tab files out of Launchpad and put on your desktop, or you put them in your Z, your Z drive, okay? So while that's doing its little thing, the other thing that I have for you here is, and I'm getting ready to show you this when this does load, is using Minitab through Gold Lab. In other words, anytime you go, you're at home and you go, you're in Gold Lab and you'll have Minitab up. And then what I've written for you here is instructions on, you know, if you've got those mini tab files sitting on your desktop or if you've got them on your Z, how do I actually get the file that I want? Because if you'll notice in your book, the one I'm going to do for you here is that example 12.2 about the field of study. For you folks that don't have the book yet, exactly when I get that example on page 17, right to the right there, there's a little thing that says data, and it says majors. That's the title. Oh. That's the title of the file that you downloaded, right? So it says majors. Every file, every problem, every example that's got a file has the title right there on the side. It's in the margin, right, where it says data. Everybody see that? Okay. So this is what mini tab looks like. You see down there on the bottom, does that look like a spreadsheet we were, look, a spreadsheet we were looking at on Tuesday? Yeah, I didn't know any better how it looks like some kind of Excel file, right? So... Here's the thing. Everything we deal with here is worksheets. So I want to open a worksheet. Window pops up. I don't care if I'm sitting here, sitting in my office, sitting at home, that window pops up. Okay? Now, I always come down here and click the computer button, and I got all kinds of choices. Now, I'm going to show you both my options here because I don't know where you saved everything. I don't know if you put them on your Z. Remember, you can only do that from a university computer, but you still have access at, access at the house. Or if you put them on your desktop. All right? So, remember, your Z is my Q. I double-click that. There's everything that's sitting on your Z or Q. Remember I had that mini tab folder that I showed you how to download? I want the mini tab folder. There's one inside of it. I want chapter one, right? That's where we're at. What was my title, my little thing here in my book on the margin? It was majors. I double click it. Mini tab wants to know do you really want to put this file in here? Well, hell, of course I do. I clicked it. I can't get around that, sorry. Now, notice, that's the table. See, column one is the categories, and column two is the percents. That's the table that's in your book here. So instead of you typing all this shit in, now I'm slow, right? Because I'm showing you what's going on. Two seconds, you've got the table in there. We're ready to roll. We don't start, because I'm going to give you problems. You don't want to type the stuff in, right? So that's the reason you download those. That's the reason we go at this like this, okay? Now, I'm going to delete this one. Right, Because that was as if it's on your Z. As soon as I chose the computer, your Z drive will show up. All right. Now, let's say you have them on your... I chose the computer button. Let's say they're on your desktop at the house. 
I need to scroll down this window. All right, where it says other. Your computer, the way this is set up, everybody see where it says local disk C on, well here it says local disk C on ETSU, that's the name of the computer. It won't say on ETSU, it'll say whatever the hell the name of your computer is at the house, it'll say local disk C on your computer name at your house. That's what you want. Now I'm going to scream at you a bunch about this because I'm thinking if I scream a little bit more, that'll save us some emails later. All right, and the reason I'm going to scream at you, I understand that there might be a C drive above this. It ain't the one you want. You're going to type, you're going to click that one, and you're going to have all kinds of shit. We only know what it is. All right, so it's always the local C under the other. If you don't have these others, we have issues with the way Citrix Receiver got installed, and then we're going to need an email. All right, so if I choose this, stuff pops up. At that point, I want users. Look, if I had anything shorter here, I'd give it to you. There ain't nothing shorter. I want users, and then I want my username. So whatever your username is at the university will show up there. There won't be this big list, right? There's very When I'm at home, there's just me and like a public one. There I am. If I choose desktop, now what you're looking at is the desktop of your computer, right? So if I choose desktop... That's that mini tab file. Remember, the, I put the folder on the desktop the other night also. There's my mini tab folder, the one inside it. There's chapter one. There's the majors. I want to put it in there. I showed you both ways, whether it was your Z or whether you put it on the desktop. Now, the reason I wanted to show you this little guy over here is because all that stuff I just went through, I actually wrote down for you in words. Whether you were sitting, when you're sitting at home, and you're looking at your, you want your Z drive, or whether you got it on a flash drive, or whether you got it on your C drive. All right? That's what that little document is there. Look, I could force you just to go to campus all the time and never show you this. It's 5.30 at night. You guys don't want to be doing no work on campus. You want to be able to do this stuff from home. That's what I'm thinking. That's the reason I show you this. I mean, I don't have many tabs sitting on my home computer. This is the way I access if I want to do something. All right? Now, let's make a bar graph, okay? I would suggest you try this little sequence of stuff over the weekend. I'm not going to sign any homework for, for the weekend, but that'll get you started. Make sure we can get, see, here's the deal. My instructions always say, when you get Minitab up and running, you see this right here? That's Minitab up and running. And now we're ready to load it in like I showed you how to load it in. That's getting Minitab up and running. You notice, I never did save anything on my desktop about mini tab or any of that stuff. It was just the files. Everything's done through that Citrix receiver and going back to Gold Lab and then logging in and then clicking it. It opens up. We're ready to roll. Okay? Now, the nice thing about mini tab is the bottom's a spreadsheet and everything's a drop-down menu and we put the right things in the right spots. So, I want to make a bar graph, a bar chart. That's a graph, right? Well, shit, it should be under the graphs heading. Yes? So, we come down here and we find bar chart. Now, here's the warning. You see how the data is given to us? The data is given to us in a table, correct? In other words, somebody's already summarized things for us and collected things up for us and told us that 10.6% of that 1.5 million chose arts and humanities. So you see this little drop-down menu? Every time you go in there, it's always set as counts of unique values. If it's given to us in terms of a table and you leave it at that, your bar graph's going to look bad. And when I mean bad, I mean wrong. All right? There's only going to be one time this semester that we use counts of unique values, and that's going to be when we do the capstone, because we'll have the raw data. Here's what I think about. That's summarized data in the table. If I had the raw data, I would have 1.5 million names and their choice. Nothing summarized. That would be the raw data. That would be counts of unique values. We don't have that. We have a table here. So I got values from a table. Now, there's choices about what kind of graph you want. We're in chapter one, man. It's a simple one, right? I can choose all kinds of crazy stuff. We'll use some of these, but for now, it's just simple. I click OK. Window opens up. This is the way Minitab operates all the time. 
Now, you see I got this graph variable and I got the categorical variable. Now it's putting the right column in the right little spot there, and it will do what it needs to do. So what's the graph variable? You notice here, only percent's showing up. What are you trying to graph? You're trying to graph the percent. So I'm not going to type anything. I'm going to put my little cursor over percent, double click. It puts it over there for me. All right? Then if I tried to do it now, it would tell me something stupid like, dude, you didn't get anything in the categorical variable here. I'm going to put my little blinker in there. And then they all show up, and now it wants to know, where's your categorical variable? What column did you put the categories in? They are in column one. I'm not going to type it. I'm going to put my cursor there. Double click. Okay? Now, the reason we do not make stuff by hand is because now if I click OK, uh, that's the one in the book. That you didn't see before, you didn't have a book, that's the one that was in the book. Now you understand why I was telling you that it looked like other biological sciences and business were the most popular, right? And um, physical sciences, math and computers, the least. So, yeah? Now, how are we doing? Seems like a lot of technology, right? Yeah, but once you get with the flow, oh, that's way faster than doing stuff by hand. Now, here's the thing. Let's say you wanted to print that out. Let's say you wanted to, you know, you're, you're doing your homework and I asked you for a graph. Don't do anything by hand. I ain't going to count it. It's got to be out of mini tab, right? So now what the hell do I do with this graph? Now, here's the warning. There's PC on this hand and there is Mac on this hand because Mac hates this stuff. And the reason Mac hates this is because right at the moment, there's some server on campus controlling my computer here, and Mac don't like that shit. Uh-uh. That's, that's the reason Mac doesn't have ever had any viruses or anything, right? Never have viruses because it won't allow that. That's the reason you have to give it all it's okay, and you have to install things because the PC, uh, okay. It'll let you do it, but then you still got to know what's going on. So I'm going to do it like this. If I'm working on a PC... Right, like I am here. If I come over here and I right click the graph, these instructions I have, remember I got mini tab instructions for you that I wrote? I think this is in there. I'm going to choose copy graph. It copied it. I'm going to come over here and open up a Word document. Maybe. What word? Get the hell out of here. Huh? I do. What does that mean? Thank you. Dude, you should be up here, man. Hey, there's your graph. You can save it as a Word document. You can print it out and give it to me, right? Okay. Now, what'd you call it? Yeah. Okay, so let's say I got a, a Mac. If you try that little move on the Mac and you do copy and you're trying to paste it somewhere, mm -mm. It, it, it'll tell you you're out of uh, memory or something. It won't let you do it if I remember right. So what you have to do is you come over here. I want to save graph as. Now look, you've got a PC. Don't worry about this part. You're going to save graph as. I always like to save them as a JPEG. Now, the question is, you're using a Mac. Where are we going to save it? Well, you have to save it on your desktop, right, at home. You don't want to save it in any of these places because I still can't get to it. So I'm going to do the computer. Where was your desktop at home? Remember I showed you these moves, where's me at, right here. There's my desktop, there might be shorter, I have no idea, I'm telling you what works, okay? Then you come over here, and you notice right there's that graph. You can put it in a Word document or whatever you have to do to print it out if you're using a Mac. There's one extra, there's extra steps with the Mac because it doesn't like those moves, okay?
that's how I get a graph out of there. I mean, those are the things we need out of here at this moment anyway is a graph. Now, there's something else I want to show you here. Because, you know, the book made two different bar graphs. It made one that looked like the one I just made, and then it made where the bars were from the largest to the smallest, right? Well, can we do that here? Well, yeah. You go to graph, bar chart, remember, we're looking at values from a table. We got the simple one. All my stuff's the same here, right? Remember, I put the percentage, the graph variable, the discipline, where did I put things? If I go to chart options, you see where it says order the main X groups by, do you want to go by default? How are they in the table? Do you want to go increasing Y, smallest to largest, decreasing Y, largest to smallest? I chose just like the book did. That's the one that's in the book. Me reordering them, does that change anything that we see here? What's the, what's the largest group still? Other biological science is business. What's the smallest group? Math and computer science, physical science. Didn't change anything. Can I order these any way I want? Does it change anything? Yeah, I can order them however I want. Now, I have a reason for keeping pointing that out to you that, look, those bars, I can move them, I can order the x axis however, however anybody wants me to do. Okay? Now, I want to do, uh, I'm going to leave that, see if that stays. Anybody got any questions about that? Johnson City, how are we? Breathing. Yeah, I know it shows up like a lot of technology here, but it's just to make your life easier is what it's going to do when we get everything working, right? It should work. What I showed you is the way it works at my house, right? It's the way it works in the office and my office and everywhere. As long as I got my mini tab files sitting on the desktop, I got the instructions there for you, right? Um, the other thing I did here, back here, is when I gave you mini tab instructions, so that was the downloading of the mini tab files. Remember, you're going to put the desktop or the Z. And then mini tab videos from Launchpad. Launchpad's got a mini tab video for everything. Oh, you want to make a bar chart? They got one. You want to make a pie chart? They got one. They got them all. Okay? And they're arranged by chapter, so you can watch a little video. You know what they're going to show you? You know the moves I just made? They're going to show the exact same thing. And then I've also went as far as, look, I'm thinking if you got a video that's titled Mini Tab Technology Video for Bar Charts, do you really need handwritten instructions at that point? If you want handwritten instructions, that's what that is. I wrote instructions. These, these have come from before, right? So I have handwritten instructions for you also. If you feel compelled to read them, other than watching a video. Now, here's the other warning about mini tab and everything. I never send you away from here and ask you to do something that I didn't show you. Uh, now, I don't probably don't go slow enough for you to write every step down, but remember, we're being recorded, so every step is there for you. Okay? Now, so at this point, I'm going to act like, okay, mini tabs there. This is how we use it. And then I'm going to go back and forth. You know, I want to make this. Here's what I do. All right. So that's the end of the story in chapter one about a categorical variable, bar graph pie chart. Should I show you the pie chart? I can show you the pie chart if you want. Um, I'm going to get that file again. So a pie chart is a graph. I'm going down to the pie chart. Now, you know, this window looks a little different here, right? Instead of it being a drop-down menu, the one that's highlighted here is chart counts of unique values. We don't have unique values, right? We got table. It wants to know, where's your categorical variable I asked you first this time? Well, that's the categories, right? That's your discipline. It wants to know about the summary variable. In other words, where was things collected up for you? What column did you put the percents or counts in? Right click, copy graph, save graph, put it on the desktop, put it in your thing. Now, we want to get fancy. I mean, I'm just showing you like, you know, Minitab's very, very powerful. If you want to get a little fancier, back to the same spot.
Data options. Now, where in the hell is that? Labels. Sorry. I was trying to remember. I have a lot of mini tab stuff to try to remember for this semester. So if I get here and I choose labels, and I choose the slice labels, and I want to use the category name. Uh, we're getting a little fancy now. You're going to put the little names on the pieces of pie. And if you want, hell, you can put the percent. But I'd actually want frequency this time because it's already percent. So it put the names on there and it put the little percent to tell you that's how much of that chunk of the pie is. All right. For me, if you can make a pie chart like the first one I showed you, I'm good to go. You know, the bar graph. Okay. I have a question for everybody. Anybody going to run away and drop now? Okay. No. So that's the end of the categorical variable story. So then you go to the next type, quantitative. Anybody remember what a quantitative variable, how you know you're looking at a quantitative variable? You think quantity, right? You think a quantity that makes sense to do a math calculation like take an average of. Just because you're seeing numbers does not mean you have a quantitative variable, correct? We could have coded the data. It could be something stupid like your area code, right? Your social security number. We're not going to take an average of those. So the graph that is most common, and why I say most common at this point is because if we were doing this by hand, they'd be the most common. Since we have the software, it probably, in other words, i got two choices here too. So I'm looking at histograms. That's one of the graphs that we use for a quantitative variable. Now, I'm going to look at the example here that's in your book. I'm going to use it. We're going to mess with it a little bit to show you if I was doing this by hand, this is what has to happen. The other reason that I'm interested in this example is, is because I want you to realize that a histogram's got bars in it also. The bar graph's got bars. This one's got bars. A histogram is not a bar graph. A histogram is used for a quantitative variable. A bar graph is used for a categorical variable. A bar graph, can I switch the categories and move the bars around? Histogram, I can't do that. I make sure that I have gaps in the bar graph to separate that category, category, that category from that one, that one, and that one. A histogram, we don't do that. The bars are butted right up to each other. Okay. So here's what we got. I got this example 1.4. And it says, what percent of your home state's high school students graduate within four years? That must be the variable that they're measuring here, and that is a quantitative variable. It says, the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001 uses on-time high school graduation rates as one of its monitoring requirements. However, in 2001, most states were not collecting the necessary data to compute these rates accurately. The freshman graduation rate counts the number of high school graduates in a given year for a state and divides that number by the ninth graders enrolled four years previously. Although the FGR can be... Really? I'm going to keep reading. The dude... Okay, here's the other thing about our book. The guy's actually giving you real data. And it's not like somebody's making this up, right? He's giving you real data and he's going to explain to you where things come from. It says, uh, although the FGR can be computed from readily available data, it neglects high school students moving it into and out of the state and may include students who have repeated a grade. Several alternative measures are available that partially correct for these deficiencies, but states have been free to choose their own measure, and the resulting rates can differ by more than 10%. Federal law now requires all states to use a common, more rigorous computation. The adjusted cohort graduation rate tracks individual students. Table 1.1 on the next page presents the data for 2010-2011, the first year in which states use a common formula for which graduation rates can be compared between states. Idaho, Kentucky, and Oklahoma received timeline extensions and were not required to file in 2010-2011. English. If I look at table 1.1, which is on page 22, there's a table there. They have all 50 states in the District of Columbia listed. They, you know, we all, for some reason, they always throw in the District of Columbia. And what you have measured for them is the percent of their high school students that graduate within four years on time. I look at this and I see Alabama, 72%. Alaska, 68 Maine, 84 Minnesota, 77 West Virginia, 76 District of Columbia, 59 
And then they have the region of the country they're in, north, south, east, right? Question, who are your individuals here? In other words, who do you have the data collected on? Yeah, I'm going back to Tuesday. The individuals are your states. Now remember, three of them aren't included, right? What was it, Idaho, Kentucky, and Oklahoma? You know, they don't have nothing listed for them. But that's my individuals, right? I got the 50 states and I got the District of Columbia. What's the variable you have measured? Percent of high school students graduating on time. Quantitative or categorical? It's quantitative, right? So, what we're interested in is the distribution of that quantitative variable. You know, we're interested in what values it can take and how often it takes them. Does the table show you the distribution? Does that table show you the distribution where I got all the states listed and I got the values? Does it show you what values it can take? Yeah, shit, that's what's in the table. Does it tell you how often? Yeah, count them up. It'll tell you how often it takes 77 or 72 or whatever. That shows you the distribution. The problem is I want to know more about the distribution than just that. It's very hard for me to understand anything about this variable from that table. All right? So, if I'm going to make a histogram, a couple thoughts here. One, I need to know what is the smallest value I see and what is the largest value I see. Well, I'm thinking the smallest value, I see, forget the ones that aren't marked. Is there like a 56 in here somewhere? The smallest I see is 56, and the largest I see is, I'm hoping it's like 70-something uh, or something like that. 80-something. 80 88 is the largest? Fifty-six? Fifty-nine. Fifty-nine is my lowest? Now, the reason I want to know that, what was the smallest and what's the largest, is because I need to chop that values up between 59 and 88. I'm not going to start at 59 and I'm not going to end at 88. I'm going to do something nice here. And what the book says to do is, and I'm going to label that as step number two, it says go from something less than 59 Right? So they say to go from 55 to less than 60. 60 is not included in that group, that class, or that bin. And then I'm going to go from 60 to less than 65. Here's what I'm doing. I'm making equal with classes. I have a reason for calling them bins. That's what many tabs are going to call them. So what you're doing is you're going to take from, I got to go from 59 to 88. I need to chop that on the number line up into where I cover everybody and they're of equal width. Right? So the next one's going to be from 65 to less than 70, 70 to less than 75, 75 to less than 80, 80 to less than 85, and then from 85 to less than 90. Can I stop? My largest one was 88. So I started below the lowest one, I go past the largest one. Now look, when you're if you're making a histogram by hand, that's the only thing you actually have to figure out, is how do I make these classes? And I would love to tell you that I always make them five. Now, it depends on the data. 
Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three. Hell, sometimes it might be 0.5. It depends on the data. Right? This is the hard part. And there's nothing I can say, let's make them five all the time. It doesn't work like that. All right? So that's the reason I'm doing exactly what the book used. Now, the next thing you do is you take your little table 1.1 and you count the number of states that fall in each one of those. Yeah, I'll give you half an hour. You come on back after you've done that. All right? So they've already done this for me, and they tell me that there is one in that group, two, three, six, 11, 16, and nine. So they, nobody, every, every state falls in only one of the little classes or bins, right? What should I get here if I add those up? What did you get? Anybody say 48? Normally, if everybody had a value, it would be the number of individuals, right? But remember, Idaho, Kentucky, and Oklahoma don't have a value. They're leaving them out of this. So this adds to... 48. If everybody had a value, it would have been 51. Everybody shows up in one and only one of these little classes or these little bins. All right? Now, step three is you're ready to draw the histogram. You're going to notice it starts very, very, very similar to a bar graph. You got your Y and you got your X. On the X goes your quantitative variable here, and the quantitative variable is percent of on time high school graduates. Now, what's going to go up your y-axis this time? I'm not telling you how we're going to mark that off. That is your count. That count can either be like frequency, a number, or it can be the percent out of the total. In this case, it is the number of states, it's the count. Now, since you're looking at a quantitative variable, it's not like you're just going to put little categories there like we did with the bar graph. We have to think about how you're going to chop up the x-axis. Did we already? Oh, that's when you made the classes in the bins. It tells you exactly how to lay things out. You're going to lay them out by fives. You're going to come down here and you're going to start and go like this. You're going to say, well, I want to go from 55 to 60, to 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90. There's no thinking there, hell, you already, if you're doing this by hand, you already did all the work to chop them up like that. Okay? Now, I got to come back up here for a second. Because I have to look at my classes, my little bins. i got to see what the smallest number is and what the largest number is. Well, the smallest one's a 1, the largest one is 16. So if I go from 0 to 20, am I good? Does everybody understand why I'm asking from 0 to 20? i got to start below the smallest one, and i got to go past the largest one. Again, I count really well by 5s. So down here is 0, 5, 10, 15, 20. Now, we're going to make little bars again, depending on how many individuals fell in a class. Well, how many was from 55 to 60? I'm going to make me look like one here. How many was from 60 to 65? How many is from 65 to 70? How many is from 70 to 75? Yeah, I'm not going any further because that's my, that's me making a histogram by hand for you. Okay? You keep going, right? Now, notice there's no gaps between the bars. When would there be a, when you're looking at a histogram, when would there be a gap between the bars? That's when you had a class that would have how many in it? Zero. Zero. Other than that, they're all pushed together, right? Can I rearrange these bars for you? Remember the bar graph, hell, I could rearrange them anyway. Can I rearrange these? You knew the x-axis goes from smallest to 
largest. So you can't start rearranging things. Whatever it is, is what it is. Okay? Now, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping at this point I have you convinced that that's not a bar graph. First off, it's not a categorical variable, it's quantitative. There's no gaps. What's your eyes supposed to respond to here? Because you notice, remember we made all the class widths, those bends the same? So your eyes are supposed to respond to the height. What's the height of the bar tell you? It tells you how many, right? It tells you how many is in that class. Whether it's a number or whether somebody gave you, told you in terms of the percent that was in that class or that bin, it's still telling you how many. So then the question is, we spent all this time, and believe me, if we were really doing this without the example and we had to do this by hand, we'd still be here counting them up in there. Does it show you the distribution of that variable, the percent of on-time high school graduates? Does it show you what values the variable can take? Now, you're supposed to look at me at this point and say, dude, you're asking a lot here. Well, you do understand that I can read. Now, forget the table for a second. If I'm looking at just the histogram, I know it takes values between 55 and 90. Yep. Do I know anybody has a 77 looking at this histogram? we got to lose something. And that's the kind of thing you lose. You don't get the individual pieces of data. Right? Do we know how often it takes these values? Oh, well, yeah, I know there's one between 55 and 60. There's two between 60 and 65. There's three between 65 and 70. I know there's six. I can read that, right? But I still don't know there's a 66 or a 40 or 62 or a 77. We lose a little bit. But it does show you the distribution. It does show you what values it can take, 55 to 90. And it, in a sense, it does show you how often by telling you how many is in a particular class between this value and that value. We lost the individual pieces of data. All right? Now, I come back here. I want to find that file. Remember I told you, everywhere you got a file, at the beginning of the example, it says data and tells you the file name, right? I'm hoping this one says something about the file name, data, says graduate, right? So I'm going to go over here to mini tab. I'm going to go to open worksheet. And I'm going to find the one that says graduate. Now, look, I'm scrolling through this down here. Notice all they did was they put that table in there for you. The first column is the state. The second column is the percent of graduates. And the third column there is that region. And I want to make a histogram here, right? So where, does anybody got any thoughts about where it should be? Histogram is a graph, right? So it's going to be under the graphs. I'm going to find histogram. It wants to know what kind you want. I just want the simple one that's already in black there. So I'm going to click OK. It wants to know where's the variable you want to graph. In other words, where's your quantitative variable? Where's the actual numbers? Not the individuals, because remember, column one, that's your individuals, right? Column two is your percent that graduate on time. That is your variable, and I'm going to put that in there. If this doesn't convince you that this is the way to attack these graphs, nothing will. You ain't never going to get faster than that. There's your graph. Now, you're looking at me like it doesn't look like mine. Well, it made its own choices for classes, right? That's what it did. So what I'm thinking is, if you'll come here, I want to show you a little bit about how I deal with the histogram to make it look like, if you want me to make it look like exactly like the book here. So I'm going to come down here and double-click the x-axis. Window pops up. And it says scale, show, binning. Binning is those little classes. That's the reason I said we make bins. So if I come here to binning, one of the things I always like the students to change is because if you'll notice this little part here, you see how they got the labels in the middle of the bars? That just drives me nuts. I can't read shit off of that. Right? So I'm going to come to binning, and I'm always going to change this midpoint to the cut point. The cut points are the ends of the bars, right, where your classes would be, okay? And so just to show you what that changes, at least it's got the labels at the end of the bars like what we were making. Now, you notice it's not going by fives now. It's going by, what does that look like? It looks to me like it's going by two and a half. Oh, Minitab makes its own choices, right? 
So if you want to change the class width, I'm going right back to where I was. Benning, and I want to tell you where things are going to be. So I went down here and clicked, where's the bullet, where do you want to make them? Well, what did we decide in this example? We went 55, 60, 65, 70. That looked like the one in the book? Exactly. Okay. Now, can I make those class widths anything I want? Yes. The only thing I'm going to ask out of you is, look, Minitab, it's pretty smart. I mean, it is a, a statistical software program, and it makes its choice. Whatever's choice it makes, I'm really happy with that. The thing I would like for you to do is, is I like to where you're, you know, you got 55 to 60 or whatever the other one was. Like, I don't want you to be marked in the middle. I like to be marked on the ends. So now I can read, right? I can read this. And you're sitting here in Minitab, and you say, well, between 55 and 60, how many is there? I don't know. Put your cursor over there. Ah, uh, there's one. Value's one. You want to know how many is between 80 and 85? I don't know. Put your cursor over there. Ah, uh, there's 16. It'll tell you that, too. Now, obviously, when you copy and paste it, it won't tell you that, but it'll tell you here if you're just looking at it. Okay? That's the way I would attack this. Now, your eyes are supposed to respond to the areas of the bars. I want to show you two pictures that are screwed up histograms. That there's something wrong here that hopefully Minitab won't do to you, but it might. Okay? So we can come up with problems. If for some reason you come up with a histogram looking like either one of these two, there's something that needs to be fixed here. These are not good pictures of the distribution. The first one I'm going to call is a skyscraper. And what I mean by that is you've made your histogram and all your individuals show up in two bars. No hell, that's possible. That's not a good thing. The problem is you have too few classes. Obviously, there's only two that everybody, all the individuals fell in. So now, does anybody remember what I just told you, that your, your only choice in doing all this was the class with, right? So how do we fix this? If you make the class with smaller, you'll spread stuff out, right? Hopefully. And you won't have them all in two. That's not a good picture of the distribution. That's not a good looking histogram. I can't read anything off of that. All right? Now, will Minitab do this to you? Probably not. It's smarter than that. But the other type of problem you can have, what would be the opposite of a skyscraper? Look, you got all these classes and you get like one or two in them. That's not a good picture either. So what's wrong with this? You have you got too many classes. So what was the fix for too few classes? It was to make the class width smaller. What's the fix for too many classes? Make widths larger. That'll fix that. Then you won't have as many. They'll be come in. Maybe they pop up a little bit. Now, with all that said, now you notice I didn't spend a bunch of time here doing all this by hand and stuff because that's not what this class is about. It's not about you making a bar graph or a pie chart or a histogram by hand. You never will. On your test, if I want you to have a histogram, it'll be in the question. On a homework, if I want a histogram or a bar chart, you're going to use Minitab and you're going to print it out and give it to me with your homework. You're not going to make any of this by hand. 
because that's just wasting our time. Because what I'm interested in now is, I mean, there's way more to this histogram idea than just saying, okay, well, then I can make it. I do want to read something to you out of the book, and sometimes I'll do this to you. It says, I'm on page 23. And I'm at the, there's a paragraph there that says, our eyes respond to the areas of the bars in the histogram. Remember, the taller they are, the more individuals are fell in there. I'm interested in about halfway down that paragraph. You must use your judgment in choosing classes to display the shape. In other words, to get a good picture of what the distribution is trying to tell you. Statistics software will choose the classes for you. The software's choice is usually a good one, but you can change it if you want. Okay, so your author of your textbook, what he's telling you is, nobody makes histograms in these things by hand. Somebody's going to use a statistical software program, and whatever choice it's making, it's making a good choice for you. That's what it's telling you, all right? That's the deal. And that's the reason why I wanted to get us started on this as soon as possible, you know, get Minitab running so I don't, we don't have to do this by hand, all right? Now, what I am really interested in is the following. You notice I never did say anything to you about the histogram other than it showed you the distribution, right? Remember, I told you you're going to ask yourself, what do I see? So what I'm thinking about is interpreting a histogram. Now, I got to add to this because there's two things going on here. Remember, remember that the histogram is showing you the distribution of your quantitative variable. So while we are interpreting the histogram, what we are doing is, is we are describing the distribution to someone. There are terms that we use for the histogram to interpret it that match up with what you are trying to describe to somebody in a distribution, right? So I'm going to do this. Yes, your book calls it interpreting a histogram. But what you're really doing for people when you do that is you are describing a distribution. And what I try to do for you is, I mean, I try to give you the terms we talk about with a histogram, and I try to tell you what those terms that you're describing, you're interpreting your histogram with is telling you about the distribution that you are looking at in it. All right? So I think about it like this. There's a number one to get us started. I want to think about an overall pattern in your histogram. And then on the flip side of that is any striking deviations. So number one is the setup. When you talk about interpreting a histogram, you want to talk about an overall pattern. And then I want to talk about striking deviations from that overall pattern. So I do it like this. See that overall pattern? Here's the way you describe an overall pattern to somebody. You give me three things. Shape. Center. And spread. Those are always the three things you give me when we're going to talk about interpreting a histogram and tell me about the overall pattern. Now, we have some options for shape. There's some shapes that we see all the time. There's some shapes we like to be able to recognize. We're going to talk about how you're going to tell me about the center, and we're going to talk about how you're going to tell me the spread. So that's when somebody's talking to you about the overall pattern you see in your histogram, the shape, center, and spread. This one here, that's number three. When somebody's talking and asking you about striking deviations, they're asking you about outliers. Now, your book has a definition of this. And where I'm at is I'm on page 25, and there's a little box there that says examining, interpreting a histogram. The last line says, an important kind of deviation is an outlier, an individual value that falls outside the overall pattern. 
Now, when we are looking at a histogram and we're saying, okay, we've got this individual in our data set and they don't fit the overall pattern, the reason they don't is, is because now, remember, I got a number line here, right, from smallest to largest. Either their value is much larger than everybody else's, that wouldn't fit the overall pattern, or their value is much smaller than everybody else's. In other words, they're stuck out in the tail by themselves away from the histogram. Their value is either much larger than the rest of, every, the, rest of the individuals, or it is much smaller. That's what makes somebody an outlier here. That's what makes an individual an outlier here. Okay? Now, we need to have a little talk about center. Okay? How are you going to tell me about the center of a histogram? Well, I think about it as the midpoint. And then if you'll give me that, can we just get right to the heart of the matter here? It's the 50-50 area point. Remember, where eyes are responding to the heights of the bars. Those are little rectangles, right? So you have area for your histogram. The midpoint is going to be the point on the x-axis of value of the variable that divides the area into half being smaller and half being larger than that value, right? Half less, half greater. That's what it's going to do for you. Now, with us, that's the, look, that's the best we can do in this chapter. If somebody wants to talk to you about where's the center of the histogram, well, you're looking at the histogram. Where's the point where if I drew a line, half the area be to the left of that line and half of the area be to the right of that line, and we're going to call that the center. Now, here's the thing again. It's almost like before. You know, let's say the, we got here and here's our halfway point. Are we all going to be exactly right, the same? No. If I asked you that on a test, you understand I'm not going to have like an answer of 62, 63, 64, 64 right? It's not, it doesn't work like that. There's no way you're going to be able to do that. This is the best we can do at the moment is give me that 50-50 area point. Give me where half the area is less, half the observations are left, and half the observations are greater, okay? For the spread, the best I can do at this moment Give me the smallest and largest values. That's as good as I can do at the moment. Now, here's the warning. And it's not a warning. We will improve these in chapter 2. Actually, we're going to calculate center and spread in chapter 2 instead of just eyeballing them off a histogram. So you're not going to see me be as crazy about center and spread here because I know the next chapter we're going to do the right thing and we're going to actually calculate them. So what you're going to see me focus in a lot here is the shape, right? Because there's no calculation there. It's what you're seeing and what the histogram is trying to tell you about the distribution, all right? So here's the thing. I want to come here and I want to look at this example, 1.5, before we do that, okay? I'm on uh, page 25 here, okay? There's a box. Now, sometimes you'll see me put a page number and I'll tell you, now if I put a page number and tell you there's a box there, this box could be even more important than the rest of the definitions, all right? What we want to look at and what this box is telling you about is the shape. We have three we like to talk about in this class, okay? One, symmetric. In other words, what you tell me is, is that the histogram looks symmetric. And to be honest with you, it's always Unless I get to pick the data, things are going to be roughly symmetric. 
What symmetric means is, is the left-hand side and the right-hand side are mirror images of each other. What that means is if I have a histogram on a piece of paper and I find the center and fold the paper, the left-hand side will lay on the right-hand side. Now, my typical roughly symmetric I always make sure I put seven bars instead of five. I'll let you go home and think about that one. Okay? Now, that's roughly symmetric. Let me ask you this. Where would the center be? Where would the 50-50 area point be here? Yeah, so with symmetric, it's really nice. It's actually in the middle of the picture, right? Remember, it's mirror images of each other. So whatever's on the left is on the right. So there's 50% here, there's 50% here. You understand, if I could fold that piece of paper on there, the left-hand side would lay exactly on top of the right. That's what makes it symmetric, right? I also think about something else here. Is This has got a single peak to it, right? There's one single hump. That's called unimodal. And then as we go both directions, and I'm thinking about this, as the value of the variable increases... Remember, that's the x-axis. We're going from smallest to largest. Going to the right, you're increasing. What happens? You get this tail going out here, and there's fewer and fewer individuals, right? The larger the value, the fewer there are. As the value of the variable decreases, you also get this tail going this way with symmetric. Now, obviously, there's way other ones that I can draw that are symmetric, that are mirror images of each other. That's the one we like here, right? That's the, always the picture I have in my head. Now, number two, just so I'm following here, is this is skewed to the right. When I think of skewed to the right, that means you have a tail to the Right. So that's the odd part. It's not where the majority of the observations are. It's where there's this tail that goes. All right? So if I had to draw one that was what I would consider to be typical, right, to get one in your head, skewed to the right looks like this. Is there a tail? Everybody see the tail? I mean, I make sure I draw you one that you can see there's a tail going out to the right. That's skewed to the right. So what happens here is, you notice, as the value of the variable increases, there are fewer and fewer observations. Where are the majority of the observations? They're on the low end of the scale there, correct? See, here's the majority. They're on the low end of whatever your scale is there, and as the value of the variable increases, there are fewer and fewer, and you're getting this tail going out there. All right? So skew to the right, there's a tail to the right. Question, where's the center at here? Before you answer, it's not in the middle of the picture. Remember, symmetric, it's in the middle of the picture, right? It's not in the middle. It actually has to be to the left of the middle of the picture, right? I'm thinking the center needs to be somewhere like remember it's the 50-50 area point it's not skewed to the right it's not in the middle of the picture it's to the left of the middle of the picture there'll be 50-50 area then now if I spend this much time talking to you about skewed to the right there's obviously a skewed to the left Pick the piece of paper up and look from the other side, and you'll see what skew to the left looks like. Okay? So I'm going to do that one for you also. Skewed to the left. Which way does the tail go now? There is a tail to the left. What should my typical picture of a histogram that's skewed to the left look like? Okay. 
I got the tail going out to the left. As the value of your variable decreases, which means as the value of the variable goes that way, there are fewer and fewer observations. Now, does everybody understand why I'm saying as the value of the variable increases and I'm pointing to the right and I'm pointing to the left when I say the value of the variable increase, decreases? It's because you're on the x-axis there, right? Remember, we went from smallest to largest. There is an order there. Hell, that's a number line, folks. That's just your regular old number line. It just depends on where you're starting and where you're ending up here. Where's the majority of the observations here? Well, in this case, when it's skewed to the left, as the value of the variable increases, decreases, there's fewer and fewer. The majority are on the high end of your scale. They're out here. Where's the center at? The center is actually to the right to get 50 in, 50 percent, half of the area. Now look, I wouldn't expect if I gave you that to you that you would draw that green line exactly where I do. But two things you don't want to do is you don't want to draw it in the middle of the picture and you don't want to draw it to the left side. Anywhere to the right, I would be happy that you know, oh shit, it's got to be out that way a little bit, right? Remember, we're eyeballing, okay? So our three favorite shapes in this class. Roughly symmetric, mirror images. Skew to the right, tail to the right. Skew to the left, tail to the left. Are there other ones? Yeah. Did we mess with them? No. Okay. Now, what I want to do here is look at this example 1.5. I want to describe that distribution. I want to interpret that histogram that we just made. Okay. So, when I think about the one with uh, that's on page... 23, figure 1.5, the one about the percent of on-time high school graduates. So this is your example 1.5 here. When I think about shape, now I'm going to add to your roughly symmetric skew to the left or skew to the right, and I'm going to ask you, how many humps do you see? In other words, how many peaks do you see? And what I see is I got one to the right-hand side of the page, right? So that is single peak. Single peak. Now, I always give you that one because what the hell am I looking at? I'm looking at that single peak. Now, statisticians, they got their own word for this. They call this unimodal one peak. Single peak. Now, is that one there in figure 1.5? Is that skewed to the left? Is that skewed to the right? Or is that roughly symmetric? That's definitely got a tail going to the left. Now, mine's a little different, right? It's a little different than that because it's class quiz. Does that got one going to the left or the right? That's got one going to the left, yes? So here's the thing about this. When you tell me that you see a histogram and you tell me it's single peaked and unimodal, I know what you mean. You've got like one big hump there. And when you tell me it's skewed to the left, we know at this moment that that means when you look at that histogram, it has got a tail to the left. You're in interpreting the histogram. Now, what does that tell me about the distribution? It tells me the majority of the states have between... Now, the reason I stopped writing... Where's the majority at? It's out here to the right, right? That was the thing I screamed at you about. It makes it easier to read. You understand that there's this other little peak there, but I'm interested in this part right here. I'm interested between 80 and 90, right? I mean, if you want to throw in the 77 and a half, the majority are between 75 and 90. Everybody agree? 
That's your one big single peak. I understand there's one there, but I'm looking big picture thinking. Between 75 and 90, right? Now, that's telling you about the unimodal part. What's the skew to the left telling you? Well, in the histogram, it's telling you this. I got a tail going out to the left. And so as the percent of uh, on-time high school graduates decreases, what happens to the number of states? There's fewer and fewer, right? They decrease, yep. As the percent of high school on-time graduates decreases, there are fewer and fewer states. Yeah, I know it's time to go to the house. We'll pick up there on Tuesday, but... So, I've done two things for you, right? Just give me just one second. This right here, that's interpreting shape of the histogram. This stuff here, that's describing the distribution, right? That's telling you about the values of the variable. That's telling you what's going on as the value of the variable changes and how your individual changes, okay? Uh, we'll come back on Tuesday. We'll look at the center real quick. We'll just eyeball it. And we'll talk about the spread. And then we'll say something about it. Everybody be careful going to the house. Here. Those. That's what I'm talking about. So when you tell me something that the histogram is, let's say, single peak unimodal, and she left, you're telling me you're interpreting the history. You're telling me that what, those, that's the language from the history. This part here in the red, now you're translating what you're telling me about the histogram into, now you're describing the distribution, right? You're telling me about the values of the variable here. You're telling me about the histogram here. Oh, you're welcome. So when you try the mini tab thing, on, you get that on the map. When you go into Gold Lab and it asks you to install, it'll put it in your downloads file as a, I think it's a DMV file. Does that sound right for the Mac? And it'll be in your downloads. You'll have to click it and, and install it, and it'll install it in your apps. Okay. And then go back in Gold Lab. Oh, you'll still be there. No. You won't be there. It'll, it'll do something funky to you. Just get out of there, install it, that DMV file, and it'll ask you a couple questions. Remember, the goldlab.etsu is your server. It'll ask you some passwords and stuff for you. Be careful that it's just asking you if they want the ETSU backslice on it or not. Okay. And then uh, go back into Gold Lab after you've installed it, and it'll be in the apps. Okay. And it should work like I work today. Okay, if it doesn't this weekend, I'll just bring my computer. On Tuesday, can you come a little early? Probably. We'll do yeah. it before because you know I got the one after and. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can. I should be able to come early if I. I have my own business on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Okay. So. Okay. No, that's okay. okay. It's just that that would make it easier on me. Right. Yeah. No, earlier would be better too because by the time I get home, she's in bed. Yeah. So or ready to go. To bed. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. No, no. no. That screen was killing me. I was like, <laughs> I know he probably thinks I'm going to sleep. I wasn't. I was listening. There you go. <laughs>